Enema started as the plaything of the physicist, became the favorite tour of the chemist, and finally went on to seduce the biochemist. These were the words of scientists Emsley and Feeney. Nuclear magnetic resonance NMR is a spectroscopic technique used to identify the molecular structure at atomic level. It explores the magnetic nature of the atom's nucleus. According to the Nobel Prize official website, the nuclear spins of these atoms and molecules assume a certain orientation in a magnetic field. This can be dislodged, however, by radio waves of certain frequencies that are characteristic for different atoms. Known as resonance frequencies, these are also affected by the atom's chemical surroundings. As a result, the phenomenon can be utilized to determine the composition and structure of various molecules. Bovine pancreatic ribonucleus was the first protein whose NMR spectrum was recorded in 1957 by scientists Saunders, Vishnia, and Kirkwood. From using a simple 40 MHz instrument to a very powerful 1.2 GHz instrument as of 2022, the usage of NMR spectroscopy in structural biology has evolved. We are at Dr. Manda Deshmukh's lab at Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology. They utilize biomolecular NMR techniques to study the structure and function of several important proteins and nucleic acids. Let us understand what an NMR spectrometer consists of. So hi, this is Dr. Mandar Deshmukh. I'm a scientist at CCMB and um, I use NMR spectroscopy. Uh, here you can see uh, the, there are three components of NMR spectroscopy. One is this magnet. And uh, if you see, this is a big barrel-like uh, structure in the gray color, resting on the three legs. The second component of the system is the probe, cryogenically cooled probe, where these uh, pipes, the hose pipes are coming and getting connected. And the third component of the spectrometer is this console, which effectively controls hmm, all the electronics. So the radio frequency pulse is generated over here. Hmm, and not only generated, it needs to be amplified and there are many facets which we will discuss very soon. The first and foremost component of any spectrometer is a magnet. And here you see a magnet, which is a 14.1 Tesla magnet. And this 14.1 Tesla magnet is essentially uh, uh, created using a superconducting technology. Superconducting technology is a technology in which you have a coil that conducts electricity. Hmm. Those of you who know very basic physics knows that if you pass a current through a coil, it generates a magnetic field which is orthogonal to the plane of the uh, flow of the electrical current. And to enhance the magnetic field, you have to pass more and more current. Of course, the kind of current that goes through this particular coil is phenomenally high. And that kind of a current cannot be passed through a coil at the room temperature. Hence, these coils, they are made of a very special alloy hmm, of neobdenum, titanium and some tungsten and some other metals. Hmm? And they are uh, very thin, extremely thin, thinner than the hair coils. And they are wound on a barrel. And then this barrel essentially, once you pass the electricity through that barrel, you get something called as a magnetic field, superconducting magnetic field. So here we go to 4 Kelvin. So something that can only remain, maintain the 4 Kelvin temperature is helium in its liquid form. Hmm? So the element helium, which is number two in the periodic table, actually if you school it, uh, essentially it goes from the gaseous phase to the liquid phase. And in the liquid phase, uh, at four degrees, it, become, uh, it becomes liquid and it maintains the superconductivity. Now, anything that is at four Kelvin, hmm, and the room temperature is say 20 degrees Celsius, which is 293 Kelvin, effectively you have a huge gradient and there is a losses due to radiation. And these losses due to the radiation has to be dampened because helium is a rare commodity. And to keep the liquid helium in the liquid form for a longer time, you need to create a huge vacuum around it. As you all know, the vacuum creates some kind of a shield for the thermal losses, energy thermal losses. Now, that is just not sufficient. So after that vacuum lies, you need to put also a liquid nitrogen line. Now, liquid nitrogen, uh, as you might know, reaches to the temperatures of uh, minus 169 degrees Celsius or something. And if you keep liquid nitrogen in the outer shell, outer layer of it, it pre-cools the other area and the liquid boil off of helium reduces. Here at this uh, stage, you can see from below in the same barrel, we have put up something called as a probe. Now this probe is also very unique for this setup. We call it as a cryogenically cooled probe. So the probe also has electronics that is kept at 17 Kelvin. Cryogenically cooled probe enhances the sensitivity almost by eight folds. And then there's a coil uh, that is uh, giving the radio frequency pulse that my colleague has just told you. And that occurs, that is that is happening at 17 Kelvin. So this is an example of an extreme engineering. Since you have to maintain 17 degrees in that coil area, 
effectively you need a unit and this is called as cryo control unit or cryo platform and this platform <coughs> this sound that you hear here hmm, essentially is taking the helium cooling that helium hmm, using a joule thomson apparatus here inside uh, cooling it to 17 kelvin and then passing it through this line so uh, this line creates a vacuum inside the probe inside the platform once the vacuum is created the helium is cooled and the cold helium is sent from here and the return helium also comes from here because every time you apply radio frequency pulse you are going to generate some heat in the system now that heat is going to increase the coil temperature a little bit when the increase in the coil temperature happens a little bit the gas has to return to here and get further cooled so this is in the in equilibrium right now so all of this setup requires uninterrupted air supply uninterrupted power supply and uh, a very close monitoring because any small changes they occur in this uh, can lead into a catastrophic failure of one or many components into the system now the problem comes is that the fringe field of this magnet would be very high and i wouldn't be able to even stand here with this camera and a cell phone in my hand hmm, had it not been ultra shielded or de-shielded from the outer side so there is an additional magnetic field that is created around this magnet from outside that essentially puts the fringe field to the legs of the magnet and these are called as ultra shield magnets and that's why this magnet looks really big inside you see there's a orange there's a, a copper color barrel and that's a copper color barrel that goes to the center so the magnetic field is strongest in the center here and the, the, that barrel shuttles your sample to the to the uh, center of the magnet these air beds are required to keep the magnet as stable as possible hmm? and uh, disconnect it from the oscillations and vibrations that are occurring in this room however there will be always some vibrations that will go through and because those vibrations are going through also this magnetic field is in a magnetic field earth has a magnetic field so we all live in a magnetic field so any small oscillations that happen on earth's magnetic field or something would alter the tiny little magnetic field of this particular magnet so during the experiment if you have such kind of oscillations and your magnet instead of at 14.1 you know some number tesla the last digits get changed your magnetic field the sample is experiencing will also not be uniform because it won't be uniform your signal will become broad and broad and broad so you won't be able to detect uh, a reasonable data so this is like a big radio station okay because radio is generated frequencies are generated from uh, here so these are the four trx's they generate the frequencies from the trx you get uh, uh, signal to the amplifier amplifier amplifies it to the value because you know when you have to tilt the magnetization from plus z to in the xy plane you need a frequency and you need a power you know and uh, this is a pulse nmr so in the pulse nmr effectively you have got um, uh, combinations of multiple frequencies many many hundreds of thousands of frequencies so that occurs uh, here so th this will generate a pulse from this thick cables that you see over here it goes through the back of the preamplifier now preamplifier's job is to eliminate all other noises and other frequencies from here and give the radio frequency to the coil through the probe and once the coil uh, hits the uh, pulse the magnetization that is aligned along plus z gets tilted into if it is a 90 degree pulse as my colleague has showed gets into the xy plane now on the return path the detector detects it it comes again to the preamplifier uh, cold preamplifier first then the preamplifier and the preamplifier further enhances the signal and you get it back to a detector hmm? and <coughs> the fact that we have got four channels over here trx uh, this is one two three and four this is essentially four nuclei we can detect at the same time we can excite and detect at the same time so we have a magnet we have a probe and we have a console now the other component is this computer so this computer not only controls what radio frequency to be given how it is to be given hmm? how to control the shim systems how to control the amplifiers but it also controls the temperature of a sample and that happens through a unit which previously used to be in the front now it has gone in the back side this is called as bvt now bvt's role is to ensure that your sample is at room temperature we are talking about 4 kelvin we are talking about 17 kelvin and we are talking about all sorts of different return temperature up temperature down temperatures but your sample protein at 17 kelvin would be frozen beyond one can think of okay or even at 4 kelvin it's just not possible that these things exist it will become so brittle that it will basically break down okay so uh, essentially uh, your sample has to be at room temperature or sometimes even higher temperature because uh, many biomolecules particularly uh, some of the proteins that come from the extremophiles or some of the polymers uh, people prefer to study at higher temperature so at that stage we need to go on this probe to 40 degrees 50 degrees 80 degrees 
uh, Celsius. Okay, to achieve this kind of temperatures, there is a separate setup called as uh, BVT, uh, which controls the temperature of the sample and temperatures of the uh, the cavity in which the sample sits. So one can think of how much of uh, you know uh, technology would have gone to get something like this. This is probably one of the best technologies. And now with the James Webb Space Telescope, the schooling of helium, they have come up with a newer technology. So I'm sure that in times to come, in another five years or something, uh, even this box will go away and that will be integrated with the probe itself. So more or less every probe could even become a cryo probe. So all the components play a crucial role. For instance, when we have to solve a molecule structure, we start by placing its sample in the spectrometer, that's the magnet, and then subjecting it to the radio frequency pulse generated from the console. And once the data is collected, it is processed and analyzed, based on which we can finally view the structure. So this completes the instrumentation side of the NMR spectroscopy.